Hi, in this video, I'm going to be demonstrating how to set up your NVR. This is the Dawa NVR for 216. This can handle two hard drives and has a throughput of 200 megabits per second. The smaller one over here is the NVR 4116. This one can only handle one hard drive. The software setup is the same for both of these NVRs. I'm going to demonstrate how to connect the hard drive, set up a basic recording schedule, do the remote view on your cell phone, and also log in via a web browser on the same network. I'll also connect via Smart PSS. Here is the NVR, here is the smaller size, this is the 4116, and this is the 4216. The 4116 is smaller, it can only fit one hard drive inside. In the box you'll get your 48 volt power supply and country specific cable. Now the 4216 can handle two hard drives. That is why it comes with two SATA cables and two SATA power adapters. Here are the 10 screws for fastening your hard drive in. And here are two clips for your cable management. You've got two sets of terminal blocks for the back of the unit. Your terminal connectors are plug in over here. And this is for your normally open and normally closed connections. And this is for your alarm outputs. Here is the Ethernet cable to connect your NVR to a switch or router and then your USB mount to control your NVR directly from the unit. Now you'll notice that this particular NVR does not come with an associated power adapter. The power supply is built into the unit. If you're setting up a smaller NVR you'll find that the smaller NVR comes with the associated power supply which is plugged into the back. Right, it's time to install the hard drive. I have to remove four screws. One on each side and two at the back. To get the cover off, all I do is I pull it from the back. As you can see, I'm lifting it from the back. Now this NVR only has space for one hard drive. The maximum capacity is 10 terabytes. These specifications do change over time as I have older units which can only handle a hard drive of four terabytes. Right, the first thing I need to do is now open the unit to install the hard drives. This NVR has screws on the back. Some NVRs have screws on the side and back. Open the screws and take off the lid. To remove the lid, all I do is I slide it back like that. This NVR has space for two hard drives. Now over here, I've got a selection of different hard drives. Popular manufacturers specify whether the hard drive is for general PC use, network attached storage or NAS use, or surveillance drives. It's best practice to use the surveillance drives in your NVR. However, any of these hard drives would work. You are not bound to use only a surveillance drive in an NVR. The NAS drive, for example, would work and even a general purpose PC drive would also work. However, having said that, try to use the surveillance drives because they are optimized for NVR data read and write processes. Now over here I have a 10 terabyte hard drive and unfortunately the maximum hard drive capacity per drive is only 6 terabytes on this particular unit. This changes from time to time as they update the firmware you find that the hard drive capacity increases. So it is likely that the unit that you have can handle a 10 terabyte capacity. Please check this on the specification list when you are making your purchase. For example this newer but smaller NVR can handle a hard drive with a 10 terabyte capacity. Right, on the hard drive you can see that it's got like an L there for the data cable and then for the power cable you can see it also has an L. Match the two L's when you're plugging in the data and the power cable. Now you can install the hard drive onto the chassis. When fitting two hard drives I find this layout is better, the cables do not bump into each other. I'm just going to be installing this one hard drive, all I do is I hold the drive and flip the NVR upside down. Using the supplied screws I now fit the four screws for each hard drive. Right, I now plug in the power source for the hard drive. Notice the clip is facing in that direction. I now plug in the first hard drive SATA cable. I'm only going to be using one hard drive for this installation. I'm now going to slide the cover back onto the chassis. Notice that there are three lips here, which needs to go underneath the steel lip here. Right, having a look at the back, I now plug in my power supply cable at the back and you can turn it on or off over there. There is a cooling fan and on this NVR I have 16 ports for my power over Ethernet cameras. Now this is a 16 channel NVR and I have 16 ports. Some NVRs come with no ports over here and some only come with 8 even though it's a 16 channel NVR. In such case you can use the onboard ports or you can use ports on a nearby switch. You can use any combination of the ports. You can for example use 8 of these ports and 8 on a power over ethernet switch or you can use all 16 or if it's an NVR like this and it happens to be 16 channel you can only get 8 channels over here. 
To power up your other eight cameras, you'll need to connect it to a power over ethernet switch. Now, in order for your NVR to have network connectivity, to be able to connect to the internet and also to have the remote view working, you'll need to connect your NVR to a nearby switch or router. There is the ethernet cable, which is going to plug into my switch or router. So for example, if I'm going to be using this power over ethernet switch to add capacity to my NVR, I will also need to plug in my NVR into the switch. As you can see, there is the ethernet cable coming from my NVR connecting to the switch, which I can now add additional cameras to. If your NVR has 32 channels, you'll be able to only get 16 of your channels over here, while the additional 16 will have to come from another power over ethernet switch nearby. If you want your remote view to be working, you'll have to connect your NVR to a switch which has network connectivity and internet access. For example, here is a router and I can connect my NVR directly to the router as long as the router has internet connectivity. You can also go from your NVR to a switch and then to your router as long as the NVR at some point is connected to the switch even if it goes via another switch. You do not have to connect your NVR directly to the router, you can have a switch in between as long as that switch is then finally connected to your router or whatever is giving you internet access. I'm gonna quickly summarize some of the methods that you can connect your NVRs. Here are the 4116, here are the 4216. Now, if your NVRs are only gonna have cameras and they're not going to have any remote view or any internet access, then you do not need to connect it to a router or a switch. You can simply plug your cameras into the back of your NVR. However, if your NVR does not have the ports at the back, or maybe you have a 16 channel NVR and there's only eight ports, or maybe you have a 32 channel NVR and there's only 16 ports, then you will need to connect your NVR to a switch in order to expand the capacity. So over here, I'm connecting my NVR to a switch. Now I can plug in additional cameras into the switch. I can plug in all the cameras to the switch or I can plug in just a few and a few over there. But my NVR needs to be connected to the switch. There is the ethernet cable. If you want to be able to log into your NVR with a computer on the same network or via Wi-Fi on the same network, you're going to need to connect your computer or laptop to the same switch. So here I've added a laptop. If I want to log into my NVR via web browser, I need to connect to that same switch. If I want to log into my NVR via a Wi-Fi connection, I need to be able to have a router or an access point that is connected to the network. Over here, I have a router. So now I'm plugging my router into the same switch. So now I have the router which is connected to the switch. My NVR is connected to the switch. Now I can access the NVR via a direct Ethernet connection or by my cell phone using a Wi-Fi link to this router or using Wi-Fi on my laptop to this router. Now, if you want to have the remote view available and be able to connect to your NVR via the internet, your router needs to have internet access. Now, if you want to connect another NVR to your switch, that is also fine. So there we go, I'm connecting another NVR to the same switch. This means that both NVRs can now access whatever cameras are plugged into this power over ethernet switch. It also means that this NVR now can access the internet because it is connected to this router which has internet connectivity. Right, now over here I have a camera. If I plug in that camera to this NVR over here, only this NVR will be able to access that camera. This NVR will not be able to access that camera because this camera is plugged in only to this NVR. If I plug the same camera into this NVR, the same applies. If I want both NVRs to have access to the camera, I'll need to plug it into the switch. From the switch, I'll be able to access the camera from both these NVRs because the camera is now plugged into this communal switch. So in summary, you can use these power over ethernet ports on the back of your NVR or you can just connect all your cameras to a power over ethernet switch. And lastly, if you run out of capacity on your network switch, you can add another power over ethernet switch. You can daisy chain these switches, which means I can populate the entire switch with cameras. But just make sure you connect your switch to your other switch. Now this NVR has VGA and HDMI output. You can use these concurrently. Now in order to set up the NVR, I can either use the VGA or the HDMI to output this to a nearby monitor. You can use the HDMI or the analog connection for the setup of your NVR. Once the NVR is set up, you can also use both of these. So that means you can feed two monitors at the same time. I then have a USB 3 connection over here for your mouse or external hard drive. There is a mic connection over here, in or out. These are analog RCA audio inputs and outputs. I can now switch on my unit now that it is plugged in. Right, for the initial setup, you don't have to have any cameras installed. As you can see, I've got the power cable connected. I'm gonna switch it on. My monitor is connected. There's my ethernet cable and there's my mouse cable. 
On the front there is also a USB connection for your mouse. Notice there are four LEDs on the front of the unit. Status, hard drive activity, network activity and power. Now analyzing the back panel, this is for the power cable. These are for your eight cameras. This is an onboard PoE, which means that your cameras can be powered directly from the unit. This is your network connection to your switch or router. This is for your monitor. You can also use an HDMI connection for your monitor. You can use the VGA and the HDMI simultaneously. There's a mic input and a mic output if you want to use it. Here is for your mouse or for USB storage device. On the front, you will see when the hard drive is working, there will be a flashing light over here. This tells you there's network connectivity, there will be an LED here, and then there's a power LED. Notice there's another USB connection over here. Right, I've now connected using a VGA cable. You can also use the HDMI. Here is the monitor. Right, just select your location, your language, and the video format. You'll need to agree to some conditions. Using your location, it will then locate the best time zone for you. You can choose another time zone should you wish. Right, just correct your date if it's wrong. You'll need to come up with a password at this point. They suggest 8 to 32 characters, including at least special characters, numbers or letters. If you do not use special characters, it will still accept the password, although it is recommended to use special characters. Right, then you can put a prompt question just to jog your memory for your password if you've forgotten. You can then select an unlock pattern or you can skip that step. Now it's very important you put your email here. If you've forgotten your password, they can email you a reset code. The security questions are also very useful. Right, once you've completed the security questions, it asks you if you want to auto check for updates. Now you can give your NVR a name. Right, so after adjusting these settings, you can go to the next screen. Right, now it's just confirming the date format. Daylight saving time, if that's applicable in your area. Now the NTP, I recommend having that on. So what it means is that your NVR will keep time by going to this website, whatever interval you set. So I'm going to make mine every 600 minutes. It doesn't have to go often. And then it maintains the correct time on the NVR. Now you can also add a holiday schedule. Now at this point you've got an option. Are you going to use the default IP address that the NVR uses? Dawa uses 192.168.1.108 or are you going to choose a unique address that is specific to your network range? Now in this case I do not want this to be my IP address so I'm going to manually change this IP address but in your case if you're happy with that IP address then just leave it. Now I want to manually change my IP address because my network will not see this address. I need to manually change it, so I'm going to say edit. Now you've got two options here. You can have DHCP on, which means that you will allow the IP address to be provided by the router that is already on your network, or maybe there's a DHCP server on your network. In most cases, it will be your router, which will then provide the NVR with an IP address. I don't like to do that. I like to give the NVR an IP address, and in my case, my network is in the eight range. So I'm now going to change this. So I've changed mine to 192.168.8.253. Why did I choose that address? Because my router's address is 192.168.8.1. So as long as I'm in the same subnet, it will be fine. I can even test it and it even says IP is available. If there was a Radiant NVR with this address on the network, there would be a clash. You have to come up with an IP address that is available. Now, for example, I know there's another camera server on my network with this address, 251. So if I test it, it says IP conflicted, meaning there's already a device using this address. So you must choose an address which is available. In my case, I know address 253 is available. Now the subnet mask, you can leave it as 255.255.255.0. And the default gateway, this is very important. Now my router's IP address is 192.168.8.1. So you must get the IP address of your router in order for your NVR to have access to the internet. If you are not going to be using any networking functions on your NVR and your NVR is not going to have remote view, then this doesn't matter. Now I can move to the next page. Now over here, they're asking you if you want to enable your peer-to-peer -peer sharing. So if you're going to be using the QR code to scan for your remote view, then you must enable this. If you're going to set up your remote view using port forwarding, then you can disable this. Now in my case, I'm going to continue the video showing you how to connect the remote view by using the QR scan. So I'm going to leave this enabled. 
Now the next screen is asking if you want to add any cameras. Now what I normally do is I first initialize the NVR, which means I'm going to skip through the next two steps. I'm going to allow the NVR to reboot to activate that new IP address. So over here, this is where we set the recording schedule. I'll come back to that. Right, so the device is partially set up now. So at this point, what I do is I reboot the NVR. Right, the NVR has booted. Now I'm going to log in and see that everything is working. Right, so I'm just going to log in. I'm now going to check my network settings. Right, so now I can confirm that the IP address is correct. And here I'm doing a quick test. And now I can go ahead and add my cameras and set up the remote view. I'm first going to show you the camera setup and then I'm going to do the remote view. All right, I have three IP cameras over here and I'm just going to plug them directly into the back of the NVR. Right, so I've now plugged in three IP cameras. Notice the port has a number. It says one, and then there's two, and there's three. Right, to get to the cameras, I click over here where it says camera. Now, if, as you can see, it's automatically added the cameras. Now, that may happen or it may not. It really depends on the cameras. Now, you'll notice that look at all this in my network. There are other cameras on this network. So the NVR has found those cameras. So if you've got other cameras which are connected to other switches, you can actually add them to your switch. I'm just going to work with these three. Now, what I'm showing here is it says port. Notice it says port one, two, and three. So now I know for sure that these are the ones that were actually plugged in physically at the back of my NVR. For example, if I want to add this camera to my NVR, Notice that it is adding it, but notice the port is saying three quadruple seven. It's not showing port one or port two or port three because it's not plugged directly in the NVR. This port one correlates to the one that I just showed earlier where the power of Ethernet connectors are on the back of your NVR. So yes, I will still be able to see this camera, but this is now a camera connected to another switch. So if yours is a 32 channel NVR and you only have 16 power over ethernet ports, you'll have to add your other 16 cameras and they may look something like this. Right, now what I need to do is just check that the password is correct. Now the reason you've got to do this is some cameras have already had their password set and sometimes you'll even need to initialize it. So if I say an uninitialized, you'll find the cameras that still need to be initialized, you'll find them here. But in my case, the cameras which I've added have already been initialized or the NVR automatically added them and put the username and password. So it automatically allocates the password which I used when I set up my NVR. Now, if your password to your camera is different, at this point, you will need to put in the camera's password. Otherwise, the camera will not function correctly. Now, if you want to see what image the camera sees, you can go to image. So if I click over image, you can see there is D1. There's D2. D3 and D4. Remember that the fourth camera was located somewhere else on my network, so that is already set up on the site. While these three cameras over here are plugged into the NVR, but they're just facing the ceiling, and that is why we see the ceiling in the live view. So if I go back here, you can see D1 is seeing the ceiling. Yes, I've got a light shining there, so that's why it's dark. D2, D3, and D4. So the, all those cameras are now working. Now, at this point, you can also make changes to the brightness, the contrast, saturation, and things like that. Right, now you can have a look at the overlay. This is where the date and the camera name is positioned in your view. So maybe you don't want it on that side, maybe you want it on that side. So you can change this. Also, you can switch it on or off. Maybe you don't want them there. Now we come to the encoding features. Now this depends on the bandwidth available on your NVR as well as the camera's specification. So if I go to registration here at the bottom, it actually says 181 of 208 megabits per second. This NVR has a throughput rate while it's advertised at 200, but here it says 208. So in my case, I can set the frame rate, the resolution and the bit rate fairly high because I've got quite a lot of bandwidth to work with. On smaller NVRs, you'll find that you only have 80. On larger NVRs, you might even find you have 360. And on very large NVRs, you'll even have a gigabit per second throughput. 
So when I come to encode, now you can determine the maximum specifications that you want your cameras to have. So here I've got the frame rate to 20, the bit rate's already set to the maximum. So if I go to camera 2 for example, you can see it says 1920 by 1080, that is already the maximum. And then the bit rate's already pretty high. But here on camera 3, I can still increase the resolution because my NVR has the capacity and I can increase this bit rate even higher. And then just don't forget to apply, otherwise the settings won't save. Now the substream is the stream that you're going to see using the remote view. Maybe you're going to see it on your cell phone, or if you're viewing it through a web browser, you can also say you want to only see the substream if your computer's not powerful enough or if you want to save data. So the substream is the stream that you usually are accessing via the internet. So you can downscale it or you can have it at maximum. The maximum in this case is just D1. Now in many cases, people set this lower because they are accessing this using their cell phone and often data is a restriction. Now, if you're going to be accessing this only over a Wi-Fi network where the data is uncapped, then you could set this all to the maximum. Keeping in mind that the higher the resolution you have here, the longer it takes to actually buffer and stream the information to you. Right, now you can set the camera name. So for example, I can just call this one desk because it's on my desk. And camera two could have been desk number two and camera three could be desk three because I've got three cameras on my desk. Now you can set your names according to the placement of your cameras. Now you'd want to set the schedule. So I go to storage and first have a look at the hard drive settings. You want it to be on override. If you have it to stop record, what happens is once the hard drive is full, it's just going to stop recording. You want it to override previously written data, which means that once the hard drive is full, it will, it will start writing over the earlier footage. Now we go to schedule. Now the way it's set up here is it's always recording. So if I go and show you the playback, if I click over here and I zoom in a bit, you can see that once the cameras were connected, it's just constantly recording. It doesn't stop. Even though these cameras are just facing my ceiling, it is just recording. And I want it only to record motion. So what I'm going to go and do now is I'm going to set it for motion. So I exit that by right clicking. I, I use the right click function to exit. And now I come to storage. And what I do is I link all the days and I click over the green to remove it. And now I check the MD motion detection box and what I do is I now make this all yellow. Now you might want to have it on regular recording or you wanted motion detection or you might even want it to alarm. You might also want IVS rules so you can play around here and set it up according to your specific needs. Then I just say apply. This is only for channel one. Now if I look at channel two this is still set to the regular recording so I want all of my channels to follow channel one. So what I need to do now is I now say copy and I say copy to the rest. You can see they are now highlighted. So I'm copying channel ones to all the rest. So now when I do that, if I go to channel two, you can see there are all the motion detection. Now when I go to the playback, now when I come to the playback, we can see there's only a little bit of yellow here. And the reason why there's only a little bit of yellow is only the one camera is picking up this light interference. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to face the cameras now and move a bit and you'll see all the motion detection working. Right, the cameras are now facing my desk and now I'm going to move in front of them and it should pick up my hand movements. Right, so when I research, there you can see as the cameras were moved, you can see that now the motion detection is kicking in. For example, there you saw my hand moving. Now, if you quickly want to see the live view, I click here and there I can see the live feed of my three cameras plus the one which is already mounted on site. Right, now the next step is to set up the remote view. Now, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to click network. Now, towards the bottom here, it says P2P. Now, I've blurred it for the reason that if anyone can see your QR code or your serial number, if they know your password, they can also log into your NVR and take over it. So that is why I've blurred this. So keep these things private. And on the left-hand side over here, we've got the cell phone client. And on the right-hand side, we've got the device QR code and serial number. In this case, we are going to need the device serial number and QR code. And make sure that your peer-to-peer -peer is enabled. 
Now what we do is we go to the app. Now in this case, I'm going to continue using the Android platform. You can do the same using the Apple platform and I'm now going to search for Dawa app. You can see there Dawa CCTV app or anything to do with Dawa should bring up the apps. Now you'll see there's quite a few. Make sure you download the one that is from Dawa Technology Company Limited. Now over here, I've already installed this one. This is the GDMSS Lite, will also work. Or you could use the GDMSS Plus. Both of these will work. Now there's the app and I'm now going to go to the add device option. So what I do is I tap home. And then over here, it says device. Now I already have some clients listed here, so I'm going to add a new one. I tap the plus, and then there's the option. It's asking me serial number or scan, IP or domain or online search. Now in this video, I'm going to show the serial number or scan. If you want to do this using port forwarding, please check out my other video showing step-by-step -step how to set up the remote view using the port forwarding option. The video is found in the Dawa playlist. Right, so in this case, I'm going to say serial number scan. Now notice how the phone is trying to scan. So now what I need to do is point the phone to the screen to capture the device serial number. Or you can manually type in the serial number. In this case, I'm going to use the scan option. Now it has find the serial number and I just say next. Now it's asking you what type of device is this. Now in this case, it's an NVR. So I just tap NVR. Now it will display the serial number and all I need to do is put in the password. Now if you had changed your username, it wouldn't say admin. For this video, I left the username as admin. I just need to put in my password. I've put in my password and then I've just given it a device name. Remember, I just called that NVR 253 and now I press the save option here. Make sure your phone is on the same network and there you can see my live view immediately working. So for example, when I put my hands in front of the camera, you can see how the live view is working. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go off the Wi-Fi and make sure it is still working. So I'm exiting my network and I'm now gonna stream by a cellular connection. Right, I'm gonna now log back into the app because I had logged out. And I just need to select the device. Now in my case, I have a few, so I'm just selecting 253. And then I'm just going to select all the cameras and I'm gonna say start live view. Now, it will take a bit more time because I'm not on the same network now. I'm going via cellular connection. You can see there come the live views. Now, just showing you the delay, there's quite a lot of lag. This is now connected via a cellular network. I'm not on my same network. And notice when I put my hand in front of the cameras, look how long it takes before the app shows my hand. So we can see there's a significant delay. And if I put it back to Wi-Fi, you can see how much quicker it is. You'll notice a much higher lag when you're no longer on the same network. Right, so the remote view is working whether I'm on the same network or on a remote network. If your remote view is not functioning properly, you can also change your DNA setting. If you click the network option, over here it says IP version and then it says preferred DNS. This is the standard Google DNS service provided. But if you want to put your router's IP address here, you can also do that. And on some networks, this is useful. Right, now in the last part of the video, I'm going to show you how to connect to your NVR via a web browser. Now I'm going to click on network. Now if I show you my IP address, it is 192.168.8.253. Now I've got to remember that address and now I can go to a computer that is on the same network. Now here is my NVR and the Ethernet is plugged in at the back here. This enables both the remote view and being able to log into the NVR using a web browser or SPSS software. Now I'm going to demonstrate how I log into the NVR via a web browser while I'm on the same network from a laptop or desktop computer. Now the first thing is I need to determine that I'm on the same network. So if I right click the network icon and go to open network and internet settings, I can then go to properties and over here I can see my IP address. This is the IP address of my computer. Now this is 192.168.8.9. So I am on the same network as the NVR. For example, the NVR is 192.168.8.253. That is in the same subnet. So recall that the IP address of my NVR is as follows, 192.168.8.253. If I press enter, 
after having inserted that IP address in the address bar of this web browser, it takes me to the NVR's login page. If yours does not take you to the NVR's login page, what you can do is quickly do a ping. You type CMD, it'll bring up the command prompt and you type ping and I put the IP address of the NVR. And as you can see, I am getting a reply from this NVR telling me that the NVR is connected to this network. Therefore, in this case, I can log in to my NVR. If you do the ping and you get no reply, that means your computer and the NVR are not on the same network or your NVR is not plugged in or not connected. If you're able to connect via the remote view, you should be able to connect via a web browser login. If you did the ping and you did not get a reply, please check that you have the correct IP address. For example, mine is 192.168.8.253. But if I mistakenly wrote 192.168.1.253, it would not work. That would be on a different network. For example, if I chose an IP address 192.168.8.1, I would have a clash because that is the IP address of my router. So I have to make sure that the IP address which I gave to the NVR is firstly available and secondly on the same network. So in this case I could have chosen any IP address as follows. I could have chosen 192.168.8.50.51 or all the way up to 254. Whichever one of these was available. Now if you're wondering why I chose the 192.168.8.253 in the first place it's because that address is address that is in the range of the other devices in my network. For example my router is sitting on that network. Now say for example your router was not 192.168.8.1 and it was say 10.0.0.2 well then your NVR would need to be on that range so your NVR could be 10.0.0. anything that's available in that range. I now just need to put in my password. After putting in my password, I now see the welcome screen. The welcome screen is slightly different to the screen that I had shown on the monitor that was plugged into the NVR. For example, if I'd like to see the live view, it is over here. So if I click on it, now you can see there are my cameras that were on my desk and shortly it will show them. If I want to do the playback, I can come here and I can select the cameras. And there you can see I can interrogate the recorded video. Right now, the last method I'm going to show to log into your NVR is using something called Smart PSS. This software can be found directly from Dawa Wiki. Here's the web address and you can download it for Windows or Mac. Right, I've already installed mine and when you boot it up, this is the interface. In order to log into your NVR, you need to click on the devices option. Now, currently mine is not shown here. Yours might automatically appear here, especially if it was on the same network. Now I'm going to show you how I can locate mine. I can either do an auto search where you can scan across certain IP addresses, but because I know my IP address, I'm just going to say add, and I'm just putting in the name 253, and I know the IP address, and now I just need to put in my username and password. Now here it appears automatically logged in. As you can see, it's green. If yours was here and it wasn't green, just go to the pen option or the edit option and just make sure you put the password in here. Once you put the password, it'll allow you to log in. Now that it's logged in, you can go and access the device. So I can now go back to the main menu. And for example, if I want to see the live view, there is 253 and there's the camera. Right, so you can see that this is an additional interface. I do like Smart PSS. It gives you quite a lot of control over the NVR. For detailed explanation of how to use Smart PSS, please check out my playlist. So that brings me to the end of the video, and thanks for watching, and cheers.